Hello, and welcome to the Origins Podcast. I'm your host, Lawrence Krauss. In this episode, I'll talk to my good friend, Penn Gillette, the famous magician, writer, comedian, atheist, and filmmaker. What you may not know about Penn is that he actually reads more widely and thoughtfully than almost anyone I've ever met, and is also one of the most rigorously ethical people I know. I wanted this opportunity to have a personal conversation with Penn about a wide range of issues, from science and politics to freedom and liberty, as well as free speech. And I also wanted to talk to him about magic, humor, and honesty in performing. And I was able to surprise him with a little sleight of hand of my own. Patreon subscribers can find the full video of this program at patreon.com slash origins podcast. I hope you enjoy this brash, quick, personal, and enlightening conversation with one of my favorite people, Penn Gillette. Thanks for being here. Well, thank you for having me. It's, it's, uh, it's something I've been looking forward to. I, uh, I've always wanted to have on this program an <laughs> omnivorous intellect. <laughs> And, and, uh, the definition of the word intellectual, people may not realize, but in my opinion, you are an intellectual. We'll, we'll try and display that. I believe mm. the best definition of intellectual I've ever heard mm. is someone who's willing to change their mind with information. That, and it, Isn't that a nice definition? It is a great— And it's important that they not just be changed their mind. With information. With information. Really to which means the... you don't need the emotion. Yeah. You can do it with information, and that's a, that's a— Separate skill. Yes. Being able to change your mind is a different skill than changing your mind with information. Absolutely. Absolutely. And and you have changed your mind, I think, a few times. In I, time I, I, pretty often. And you like information, but we'll get there. We'll get I do. There. I do. But first, I want to ask, I want to start to go back in okay. time. Why magic? Uh, I think um, I never chose magic. It chose uh, you? No, I had say a, that. I had a... Um, I had a many many children have mm. a romance with mm. magic. Yeah, sure. I had quite the opposite. Uh, I disliked it. Uh, I cared, uh, and still care, uh, desperately, and maybe even um, in in a silly way about the truth. Mm-hmm. Uh, I care about it very much, and the idea that there was a profession where um, where people gave false information drove me crazy. And so when, uh, you may not know this because no one in the world does, but the act that was on after the Beatles was a magician. Oh, <laughs> uh, no, I don't remember. I watched it. I was alive yeah, then, but I, yeah, yeah okay. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, you know, <laughs> it's always really funny because never, ever <laughs> remembered, yeah. remembered, but um, on Ed Sullivan. And um, I would watch uh, television to see the rock and roll bands yeah. and ignored the magicians. And I was a juggler. Mm-hmm. And jugglers, although they're the same strata, mm-hmm. the bottom of show business, yeah. <laughs> uh, they uh, entirely different philosophical thing. Mm-hmm. You want all your skill to show in juggling. Yeah, yeah. You want your skill to be hidden in magic. Yeah. And uh, there was a was an event that I I, I believe, and I, I, you know mm-hmm. that I'm obsessed with this. I've mm-hmm. told this story so many times that we know that it's not true in the details. Yeah, sure, yeah. Uh, but emotionally, mm-hmm. it's maybe one of one of my, uh, well, origin stories. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, there's a guy named Kreskin, mm-hmm. still around. I know, I'm Canadian, uh, as a yeah, matter of fact. Yeah, mind reader, mm-hmm. uh, supposedly. And he came out with uh, a show uh-huh. that he would do on, he didn't do it on Carson, because yeah. Carson hated him. Uh-huh. But there was some show he did where he came out and demonstrated mm-hmm. uh, mind reading ability and yeah. talked about the science mm-hmm. of this. At that time, uh, the best I can figure from when the game was released and so on and going back and doing yeah. a little bit of forensics, I was probably 13. Okay. Um, he came out with that. I was very into science, uh-huh. crazy into science. I read science all the time. I love science, and that was going to be my life. And I watched him do this scientific experiment as he presented it. As he presented on it. On TV. Mm. And he had this ESP kit that he sold. Yeah, which I remember was a, that. Which was a little uh, pendulum with a, the idiomatic movements and, yeah. the, uh, and, the, and the ESP cards. And my parents, uh, uh, my dad was a jail guard. Uh-huh. Um, uh, I have wonderful relationship with my parents. They were not wealthy. 
Sure. Um, but this was science. Mm-hmm. So I could buy this ESP kit. Yeah, yeah, so yeah. I bought the ESP kit. My sister, much older than me, she's, she was 23 when I was born. Wow. So I was raised essentially as an only child yeah. with my sister sure. living yeah. in town. Um, and uh, so my mom and dad, every night, would run through this stupid ESP kit with For me. You. Oh, and I, and nice. I kept all the records and kept everything carefully and did all the graphs and all the science. And then as luck would have it, I was very into juggling. Uh, the juggling section of the library, if you remember your Dewey Decimal System, okay. is... Oh, uh, yeah, it's ingrained. <laughs> very very close to religion, by the way. Yeah, me. yeah. Uh, all in the 900s, <laughs> yeah, I think. Yeah. Um, and, uh, and juggling is near the magic, uh-huh. right? Uh, so I, I remember that. I saw a book uh, by Dunninger. Uh-huh. And just kind of thumbing through it, and the tricks started to look similar to what Kreskin Kreskin had done oh, I see. as ESP. Uh-huh. And I finally looked through and found the trick. Uh-huh. And my reaction was so inappropriate. You had an inappropriate reaction? I can't believe it. I, I was heartbroken. I was destroyed. Yeah. The fact that a scientist, yeah. now putting this in my terms, yeah, then, sure. Yeah. The fact that a scientist went on TV and lied to me, oh. uh, 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 inconsolable and embarrassed in front of my parents. Mom and uh, Dad, I was making you do so this, and it was, it was all, all stupid. Filthy. It was all jive. Uh. And I went from, and this is absolutely true, from straight A's in science to flunking. Wow. To being directly to my science teacher, I want nothing to do with you people. You lie to people. Wow. And my entire school career changed there. And I went from a straight A student to flunking the rest. Of, rest. That was the that, demarcation. Wow. And my hatred for magicians and scientists who to me were the same. So we're the same. Now, I'm, you got to see this all as a twelve-year-old. Sure, absolutely. I mean, there's no background, no you know, no you know, yeah, no perspective of what what the difference. And then uh, through a kind of uninteresting uh, series of events. I met Teller, uh-huh. and Teller simply said to me, he said, uh, you can do magic without lying. He said, you can say, we're going to do this, we're going to play around with this, but you can do it. And Teller also said something to me that was uh, so insane uh, that's a conversation we've still been having to uh-huh. this day. Teller said magic is essentially an intellectual art form. It has to be intellectual because it happens at the intellectual level. Yeah. It's intellectual in a way that music has intellect added on to it. Dance has intellect added, added on to it. it. Even writing has intellect added on to it. But so, uh, magic is actually happening in the intellect. Yeah. It is uh-huh. It is experimenting. If you wanted to be pretentious, and boy, I do. Yeah, uh, I know you that. Would see, you would say that um, magic is playful epistemolo- epistemological study, right? You're yeah. deciding how do we ascertain what's true. It, it, I, I want to continue. That's this is fascinating. But it, it's it, would you say it's kind of like humor then, which is another thing. You, I mean, humor also happens completely in the intellect. Yes, it, it is. It is like that, except uh, humor's subject. Yeah, is not the very that, thing that, it's talking about. That. Magic is pretty straightforward. Yeah, its yeah. subject is actually what you're doing. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, this is there's fascinating. no there's it's... no turns on it. There's no twists on it. And uh, Teller and I, uh, Jerry Seinfeld. 30 years ago, gave me permission to use this line as my own. Okay. He said, you quote it all the time. You don't have to say okay. Jerry Seinfeld. But you're doing Just it because you're it. an honest but man. But every time I do it, yeah. Jerry Seinfeld said, all magic is, here's a quarter, now it's gone, you're a jerk, now it's back, you're an asshole, show's over. <laughs> what that means to me is that magic always insults the audience on several different levels. Uh-huh. On the one level, here's a quarter, now it's gone, you're a jerk. Uh-huh. On the other level of, I just got back from my studies in China and here's what I discovered. Yeah. Uh, it also insults them in, um, you know, uh, uh, torturing women in front of mylar, you yeah, know, just yeah. uh, uh, tacky, tasteless. There's all this, um, this level uh, because... Just changing at this point. Just we're right at the yeah, cusp yeah, of this yeah. changing. But up until now, essentially a masculine mm-hmm. art form uh, that is built on um, some of the bad parts of adolescent boys, 
not, not that there are any good parts of adolescent <laughs> boys, but um, the worst parts really builds <laughs> upon them because it's this kind of us and them, and I know this and you don't, and I can fool you. And Teller and I became fascinated uh-huh. with could we do a magic show with really good tricks? I mean, that's important. Yeah, with yeah. really good tricks, tricks that didn't insult the audience, that I could just come out and say, we're going to do this, and also follow a rule that is the most stringent rule we put on ourselves that we have not always followed. We uh-huh. fail. We fall short of this. Although the show we have now, damn okay. close. Okay. Um, I want to follow the sawing a person in half rule, which, which is, is um, th- by the way, this is... Uh, the stuff that I'm telling you is not at all magic culture. Yes. This is strictly Penn and Teller well, culture. That's, that's uh, what I want to hear about. Um, when you uh, ostensibly saw a human being in half on stage in a magic show, mm-hmm. nobody, and to be careful, I mean nobody, maybe someone very young or extremely mentally ill, but we can just say nobody, yeah. leaves the theater believing they witnessed a murder. Yeah, yeah. No one leaves the theater that way. That's my rule for every trick in the show. No one should leave the theater believing something that I know not to be true. That's a very important rule. Really hard. Yeah. Because I want to tell you that I'm doing certain Mm -hmm. mind reading things by reading Mm -hmm. your body language, but I'm not. Yeah, yeah. And I want to tell you this Mm -hmm. thing is a memory Mm -hmm. thing, but it's It's not. not. And I want to tell you that that person, but but it's not. (laughs) Uh, Now, I can lie to you. uh, Yeah. During a trick, yeah. As long as the yeah. end of it, but you, it's on the end of the, you know. And I can also don't have to tell you how it's done. Yeah. You just can't leave, leave the, theater the theater believing thing. something that I know not to be true that I told you was. This relates. But, but by the way, I want to very get this. hard. It is very hard. Wicked hard. <laughs> and I want and I want to, this relates to a quote that I think will, that I read in something you wrote. But first, I should say interesting when you talk about the worst in adolescent boys, because you and Teller, in some way, in many ways, are the least macho. I'm the least. O- overtly macho people I know in the sense of y- y- the, you're not at adoles- you're you're you you may have the mind of an adolescent boy but, <laughs> in a but, jar yeah in a jar <laughs> but but in terms of uh, ma- macho-ness well that's another not... one of the the rules which mm-hmm. uh we say crudely mm-hmm. women with big tits know it yeah um we have never commented on anyone's appearance on stage absolutely ever. Yeah. and I mean this uh if you're a very very attractive man or yeah. woman yeah or if you have a blue mohawk yeah, yeah. or if you are a, a little person yeah 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 or if you if uh, we've had people on stage under four foot yeah we've had people on stage I've, I've been to many of your shows and i've always been amazed to bring people up on stage and it's ecumenical. no comment no no because they know everything about them there's no surprise there's no mm, interest yeah, there's yeah. nothing and it's none of my fucking business. Exactly. And I've just done this thing that was also hard. And mm-hmm. I did it because I knew it had to be done, mm-hmm. but I was putting it off. I was putting it off for about a year. Mm-hmm. Uh, and it's it's harder than it seems at first. I have now made our show, and I, I, I hesitate to say this because I sometimes slip up yeah, sure. for comedic reasons for rhythm. Y- yeah. But I believe our show is now completely gender neut- neutral. Uh, and it's really hard because ladies and gentlemen yeah, has yeah, to go. Yeah, yeah. And the other thing that's very hard for me is that, uh, as you know, I'm very, very badly educated. And <laughs> well, for well, that, for that reason, the first law certain talking. kinds of speaking mm-hmm. are important to me. Yeah, yeah. So using the plural third person mm-hmm. for singular, yeah, fingernails on chalkboard. To yeah, because yeah, it's yeah. the way I was. Everybody in my neighborhood did that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I didn't want to. So I always want to say he or she. Yeah. So saying they is. feels like it shows me as being stupid and uneducated, mm-hmm. and I don't want to do that, but I now have realized that that's right. So I've gone through our show wow. and made it that. so it's only they is the pronoun, and I use people's names, but I never say the man over, over here, here or he or she. And there's one or two places where rhythmically, mm-hmm. it's very hard to know that I mean that yeah, person that, when the line has to go chromatically. Yeah. And I'm fighting the poetic rhythm, mm-hmm. you know, just the prosody of it. Yeah. I'm fighting that so hard against what I know is right. But I think in the long run, it's worth it. And why, one of the why, things why, that why? beat me up mm-hmm. was um, I made, uh, you know, uh, it happens. Yeah. I made a couple of uh, missed calls gender-wise. And, that, and I got to tell you, it happened in the first bit of the show. 
And right. I was still going, motherfucker, right. yeah. by the end of the show. And yeah. after the show, it was like, you know, standing ovation, 3,000 yeah. people. They come back to get my mics off, and I'm going, oh, that poor person. Yeah, and yeah, I yeah. Miss, so that I was going to ask, so that's the reason? Is that no, no, that wasn't the reason. The reason is it's the right thing to do. do. Yeah. Uh, that was one of the things that I said, you know, Ben, hurry up, fix this, then that won't happen again to you. Yeah, okay. But, okay. you know, you, you work so, especially in a show, uh, we're not doing a show like Let, uh, like Letterman or Fallon. Yeah, yeah, we're doing yeah. a show. We do the same show yeah. many nights. Mm -hmm. So one of the joys of that is getting the exact sound of the words to be perfect. Perfect. Yeah. A pop, 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 pop. I can put an iambic when I want it. I can yeah, hit yeah. this. I can do that. The accent is yeah. here. So when you say to me, "Oh, by the way, Penn, you're changing all your pronouns," yeah. uh, the 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 speaker in me. Yeah rages yeah but the uh the the humanitarian yeah, yeah. in me says it's about fucking time you should have probably done this in 1970 <laughs> well it, 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 i mean we'll get to that because what i've always as being privileged to be your friend the two things i know about you is that a you're an incredible humanitarian b you're incredibly disciplined I, I, I'm amazed at your discipline, but we'll get to that. Before. Enough of, of enough about Penn. Um, <laughs> okay. <laughs> but, you know, one thing, so you were talking about how to do a show, and I, I went on this segue because I wanted to hear this, but but now I want to get back. You, how, to, how, how to do a show without, a, a, you know, without having the public have the wrong impression. There's a quote from your book that I, that I think is interesting, uh, one of your books, and it, and it relates to Randy. You said Penn and Teller wouldn't be Penn and Teller without Randy. And he said, you can spend your time studying how to lie to use that to tell the truth. Mm -hmm. So tell me about that and Randy. And, 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 um, and in fact, in that, also in that, that discussion of Randy's importance, you also, to, I love the anecdote you told me about Randy. So can, maybe you can, or in, you remember that? Which one? Well, the one that related to, after he told you that, you were at the Randy Foundation and you did something. Oh, yeah. <laughs> okay. Well, you know, uh, Randy, uh, James Randy, Really interesting cat. Yeah. Uh, and uh, I see mistakes in Randy mm -hmm. that I see myself repeating. Randy did not go to college. Mm -hmm. okay. Randy did not finish high school, uh, kind of like me. He finished high school on a plea bargain. Um, <laughs> didn't really properly go through yeah. school, and his education was terrible. Mm -hmm. And uh, he, he then discovered that he loved studying science on his own, loved learning things on his own. And then, um, like Houdini before him, mm -hmm. he discovered that a lot of scientists were being hoodwinked by people doing magic tricks. And because of his lack of education, there was a huge amount of um, prejudice mm -hmm. saying we don't need some piece of carny trash yeah. to come in here and tell us what this guy's doing. We're working on the way the yeah, mind yeah, interacts yeah, yeah, with yeah. metal. And he's going, you need some guy who knows how to do a switch, man. We, and <laughs> I remember I, how much he affected me. He was the first person who told me this and then about science. That the big problem of science, and I've seen it internally, is it makes a presumption that people are telling the truth. Yes. And the minute you lie, the scientists have no defense. Well, that was it. That was it doing, <laughs> doing, doing, uh, doing magic for F Richard Feynman. Yeah. You know what I mean? And Richard Feynman was a worldly guy. He yeah. was not a, he was yeah. not an ivory tower. Sure. Kind yeah. Of yeah. Guy. Just brilliant. But you could tell that even doing a simple card trick for him, his mind did not yeah. want to go to the fact that yeah. what you were saying might not yeah, be, be true. true. And, and I remember Randy saying, you know, well, you, this is a famous story for him, but I remember hearing him say, you know, when he was trying to show the, the scientists who were claiming they were discovering mind readers that, hey, I'm going to send these guys in and I'm just going to say, if anyone asks you, are you lying and tricking? Say yes. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. And, 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 and then, yeah, and no one ever bothered it because yeah. the scientists and science, and that's a, 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 a uh, sort of an Achilles heel of science is you assume researchers are telling the truth. When they lie, it takes a long time to recover that. A long time. And, yeah, and, it's, and, and it's we're now we're now getting uh, uh, and one. I mean, to me, one of the most fascinating things about science is that the whole thing is a uh, a set of procedures to stop you from lying to yourself. Yeah, that's the whole the science because we know that we all do lie to ourselves, we, yeah. and it's built in to overcome the scientists. Science overcomes scientists. Like so when you're say. when you're obsessed with that, mm -hmm. and then you actually have a real bad actor. Yeah, you know what I mean. 
We're all working together. We're all holding yeah. hands, kumbaya. Yeah. We're all going to find a way to get rid of all our biases. Yeah. And one of the guys holding hands is this palming was, off a card. It, it, yeah. You guys are screwed. You were screwed. <laughs> exactly. And then, you know, I haven't seen this, you know, because we're following in Randy's footsteps, mm. but some very cruel things said to Randy. We don't want some high school dropout coming oh, really? in here and telling uh, us uh. to do this stuff. And he was saying, I'm not going to tell you about anything yeah. <laughs> except what the guy's, the guy's doing under the it. table. Yeah. You yeah. know what I mean? He's just, he's just doing this and uh it really is funny because uh the scientists were being fooled with stuff that was so rudimentary yeah so yeah so, so rudimentary. deeply rudimentary and one of the things and some of the stuff so heartbreaking this uh this woman uh science writer Mm -hmm. was interviewing uh, uh, a spoonbender guy. Yeah, yeah. I don't know You're who not, it was. Wasn't Yuri Geller or something? I'm not sure. Yeah. Probably, but yeah. I don't know who it was exactly. Spoonbending guy. And yeah. uh, he had done this miracle yeah. for her. And, um, and uh, Randy was saying, was he ever out of your sight? Was mm -hmm. he ever this? Mm -hmm. And talking through the way yeah. I could talk you through if you saw a magic trick. Sure. Talk, did you ever? Yeah, did, 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 yeah, yeah. And finally, like five times through the list, she said, well, there was that time when the coffee was spilled. <laughs> And he said, what? And she said, oh, it was awful. He spilled scalding coffee down my front and it burned my chest. And I was also embarrassed and I turned and had to get cold water on it and change my shirt. Oh. And Randy said, and that was while he was holding the spoon. And she said, yes, but nobody would burn pour scalding, <laughs> scalding coffee on my chest. And Randy went, you met the guy who would. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's, you know, I can understand that. You see, for, that wasn't even, for a scientist, you know, just, that didn't uh, happen. Yeah, they wouldn't even presume it. Yeah. And, well, and it's I'm also, handing you this spoon, and now, yeah. oh, there's over, there's yeah, over, yeah, yeah. okay, back to the spoon. <laughs> yeah. And I guess that's the cause of some of the reaction. When you say the most rudimentary things, can you imagine how these educated scientists must feel after the fact? Knowing the most trivial ruse right. was worked on them, but also, also there's there's this horribly offensive things that people do in magic. They're not they're not even aware yeah. of it, and they'll say, uh, uh, "I've heard different versions of this." You know, I'm a really smart guy, and yet yeah. you fooled me. Yeah. And you go, well, while you, what do you do? You you program a machine code yeah. while you were working on that. I was working on this. Yeah, yeah, exactly. You know? And you know, you're a surgeon. Yeah, and and. I I worked on stuff too. That doesn't mean I can go in and, and, and do, and an do surgery. Yeah. I can't. We do different things. That's one of the reasons the world works so well. And then, of course, the other side is just as bad, which is, you know, I know nothing about it. anybody can <laughs> fool me. You were really good. <laughs> yeah. yeah, that makes you feel great. <laughs> and, the, and the answer is is very very simple. You could just say, "Wow, that was good." Yeah, and you're was, done. And you're done. Exactly. <laughs> you don't have to put a "fuck you" before or after. Yeah, yeah. But I like that phrase because you say it basically made you who you are, Brandy phrase that you can study yeah. how to lie to learn how to tell the truth and that really did that really impact on both of you that uh, i mean did it really yeah, do you yeah. remember uh it, well it, it, you know teller um mm -hmm. gives me a great deal of credit because he says he had that you know um uh I, i'm a liar who tells the truth uh -huh. idea of magic but he said that uh i'm the one who is steadfastly obsessed with it i mean yeah. there have been there have been meetings we've had where Teller's gone, oh, it'd be a really good trick. Can yeah, we just, yeah, yeah. <laughs> can we just, can we just, it would really fuck them good. It would just, we just, and I kind of go, let me get a wording, let me get a wording. Let me. And the other thing you can't do, and this is, this is why my, my wording was so convoluted mm -hmm. on the Sawing Woman in Half. Mm -hmm. Um, because I will not say I have to ultimately tell the truth. Because mm -hmm. there's this thing that mentalists, mind mm -hmm. readers, everyone want to call mm -hmm. them do, where they uh, they do weasel words and then believe they've told the truth. Oh, I see. I use my five senses to create an illusion of a six. Okay. Or they'll say, this is, this is my favorite one. Everything I do, you could do with practice. Which oh. says I have yeah. mind reading act, yeah, yeah, you know? yeah, yeah. and they'll tell you afterwards. They'll be very self righteous and say, "Oh, I told them it's all a trick." Yeah. And I go, no, yeah, you didn't. No. You can't just tell them it's a trick. Like, you have to tell them so they understand. Yeah, it. yeah, yeah. You know, mm. and I—that's I, a really important distinction. So it means I'm saying they don't leave the theater believing something I know not to be true. Not that I told them the truth. 
Yeah. Those are very different things. Yeah, those are very- I'm taking full responsibility for your understanding, yeah. which is, you know, hubris, certainly. Yeah, yeah. But it's, it, it's a very lofty goal. Okay, so here's so he so he influenced you, but nevertheless, he, he told you this, and then you tried to lie to him. <laughs> and you talk about me, the busts. Yeah, yeah. Why don't you tell? Why don't you tell the story? It's such a good story. <laughs> well, uh, Randy was very proud of mm-hmm. having this bust yeah. of Houdini, uh-huh. uh, and it was from a uh, museum in Niagara Falls. Oh, okay, and it had burned down. Oh, okay. And Randy had the only copy of this bust of Houdini mm-hmm. that was very, very famous. He was very, very proud of it. And this is a fairly recent story. Yeah. This is just like 15, maybe 20 years ago, mm-hmm. um, but not ancient history. Mm-hmm. And uh, uh, we were visiting mm-hmm. the uh, the uh, educational foundation, and he had this bust here, mm-hmm. and it was all in a case, and very, very proud of it. And uh, well, Teller and I saw that. And I got an idea. Uh-huh. I got a little idea up my head. So while Teller was talking to Randy, I went off into the other room and made a huge number of phone calls to find someone in Florida uh-huh. who would able to do casting, uh-huh. any sort of casting. Uh-huh. And I found this uh, like B movie company where the people did casting. Now, of course, I have no reason to trust them except I trust everybody. Yeah. So I called them up and said, "Hi, this is Penn. Uh-huh. We're going to call Penn and Teller. Um, uh, I want to break into uh, James Randy's." Uh, uh, Center for Inquiry tonight, mm-hmm. and I want to uh, break into a case and take his <laughs> cast of Houdini and make a copy of it. Uh, can you do that in uh, eight hours? Wow. <laughs> it's amazing you could find something. First of all. <laughs> and uh, they said, well, you know, I got stuff to do, yeah, and, yeah. and I pulled out the checkbook and kept up in the amount, up in the amount, up in the amount. Until they finally finally found it was more. Suddenly found they had nothing to do that night. Yeah, (laughs) And then, you know, Randy dropped me off at the hotel, Uh right? Good night, Randy. (laughs) (laughs) Pick us up for breakfast the next morning. And then I ran back, met them in the parking lot. I'd scoped out the place. Uh I broke in. Uh And then I said, we're going to open this case and this is valuable. And we're we're going to make a copy of it. So they have all the plaster of Paris, and there I am with them for you know six hours. Oh my god! <sighs> uh, yeah. <sighs> but I wanted to make sure I, I didn't yeah. want to lose the bust of Houdini. Yeah, sure. So we then had a uh, a negative. Uh, yeah, of course. Yeah, yeah. Of it, mm-hmm. and put it back in there and cleaned it yeah. up. Of course, it was plaster of Paris on everything, everywhere. newspapers, and we're mopping up and everything else. And I send them off, and then. Um, I run back to the hotel, uh-huh. right? And, <laughs> and I get up and Randy comes and picks me up. We go out to breakfast. Uh-huh. Nothing is nothing, said. Nothing. We go in, go da 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 And then uh, four months later, five months later, Randy comes to visit uh, us in Vegas. Mm-hmm. And he comes over to my house and there are um, 30 <laughs> Bus Houdini all over my house in gold, in bronze, in plaster. And he goes over to Tellers and they're all over the place. And then he goes backstage and they're all over the place. And nothing is said. Nothing. Nothing is said. I never say, hey, do you like this bus? Yeah. I never say anything. And Randy at about bus, <laughs> bus number 70, Randy just goes, fuck you. Oh, does he say that? <laughs> it's kind of quietly. I don't know why he. I, I don't know why. He, no, no. Because you can get with, these things. With absolute I could, love. I thought you could get those things in any in any <laughs> airport. <laughs> I, I just, you know, I had a few myself. I. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah, see, they're everywhere. <laughs> they're everywhere. <laughs> it's fabulous. Yeah, Randy. And Randy, of course, Randy would not have even said, fuck you, until he'd figured out the whole oh, thing. Yeah, yeah. He had to have the whole oh, thing listen. figured out. You know what I mean? Randy would not say, how did you do that? Yeah. That is not, not Randy. in Randy's ego. Yeah, yeah. You know, so I had to say, yeah, Randy, you know that night? I know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. When was he alone? When can when, you when you to, yeah, that's right. Well, you have to figure this one out. Okay. <laughs> okay, look, that's uh, I, I've been waiting to do that. I've been waiting to do that all week. So now my, my life is complete. <laughs> <laughs> you can get on with the interview. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I uh, You don't know how hard it was to concentrate on what you were saying. <laughs> <laughs> Let me, uh, another quote that I really liked it from you is, exceptions prove the rule. 
I, I, and and I, I yeah. So I, I, talk about that. I was actually I I hate to say this. It, mm-hmm. I found that remarkably profound. I mean, your discussion. It really it really impacted yeah, the on fact me. that everybody used that wrong. Yeah, everyone. I never it never had occurred to me. And I, I it's I mean, you said a lot of things to me actually in the time I've known you, frankly and honestly, that have caused me to say. I never thought of things that way. Well, that's, you know, it's just a grammar thing. Yeah, yeah. But the exception proves the rule has always driven me crazy. Yeah. Because the way it's used colloquially, yeah. it is nonsense. Yeah. I mean, the exception destroys the rule. That's Absolutely. all there is to it. Yeah. But the way it is actually meant in the proper translation is that if it says no parking three to five on Wednesday, okay. it means there's parking, parking other every, time. Yeah, 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 yeah exactly. <laughs> if you say you can't play your music over 120 <laughs> dB <laughs> Monday <laughs> through Friday, Friday, it means <laughs> you can play it Saturday and Sunday. <laughs> yeah. And I, it's a huge revelation to it me. It is. It really huge is. Huge revelation. Yeah. And then it's a really sensible thing to say. Yeah. And it's a useful way to think about something, you know. Uh, you can't touch me there means you can touch me somewhere else. <laughs> uh, We're not. Well, <laughs> <laughs> okay, let's go back to the parking. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Parking is safer, I think, at this okay. point. <laughs> no, it's really an interesting, and, and, uh, and uh, yeah, in the context of what you do, I think it's really neat. Yeah. In some sense, magic is some. And, well, you know, th- there's a thing about magic, and you didn't ask me this, but I'm going to answer it anyway. Good, I'm, and I'll I've, pretend I did. I've been thinking about this a, a lot lately, is there's this thing that's very popular. Mm-hmm. Whenever shrinks and psych, you know, science people want to talk about magic, mm-hmm. they always say it shows up the flaws in our thinking. It underlines the yeah. flaws in mm-hmm. our thinking. And that is such bullshit. What magic does is it underlies how well our thinking works. You know, mm-hmm. I take this, I put it into this mm-hmm. hand. Uh-huh. And you assume it I mean, goes into this yeah, hand. Yeah. Good. Yeah. Because if you don't assume that every time, yeah. you're wasting a lot yeah, of brain power. Because yeah, exactly. yeah, <laughs> it's only not going to be yeah, true yeah, when you go to see that one room. stupid show yeah. in Vegas. Yeah. That's the one time. Yeah. There's no way evolution had to prepare you for that. Exactly. So all this stuff where you where you just assume this, mm-hmm. and there's all these people who teach magic going, we have to teach people not to make these assumptions. No, 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 no. no. It's a celebration of the of fact. Isn't it great that every time that goes across there, we think that? Isn't that great? And then I didn't do it. And look how surprised I am. Because it works so well. It, because evolution works. Not because works. it's broken. Yeah, yeah. It's because it's, it works well. There are some people who don't, there are some people who, for whom it, they don't follow that. Those people don't reproduce. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. Those people are still spending a lot of time going, maybe it's still in that hand. <laughs> uh, but that's, Natural uh, selection is a wonderful thing. That, 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 all, all of that stuff. Mm-hmm. You know, and that's why um, the, the correlation between being fooled at magic and being stupid is is so, so bothersome to me. Yeah. Because it really is a celebration of this kind of intellect and how we determine what's correct, you know. Yeah, well, you know, I mean, and I think, I don't know if everyone relates this way. I know my wife feels, a, I watch her, I love to watch her watch magic, but I feel the same way. And maybe it's the same as humor. It's so... It titillates you. It 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 literally does. It 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 when you see that and it isn't what you expected. There's something about it that just causes such a buzz. Well, you know, uh, Salvador Dali said. Mm-hmm. Uh, I, I won't get this quotation exactly mm-hmm. right because mm-hmm. I never do. Mm-hmm. But it's something along the mm-hmm. lines of, uh, "Why is it so seldom?" When I order a lobster in a restaurant, they bring me a phone book that's on fire. <laughs> so little of what might happen does happen. Yeah, that you know that make the that make a good trick sometimes. <laughs> exactly. Believe me, we've talked about it. We just went to the Dolly Museum, and I said to tell her, you know, yeah. if I wear a top hat and you wear a big mustache, and we're Dolly and Magritte, and we do a little surreal scene. It will be wonderful. Yeah. Now all we need is a trick. <laughs> <laughs> That's the basis. <laughs> but you know, walking out with the top hat. Oh, be beautiful. Not, I don't mean top. I mean yeah, derby. Yeah, yeah the derby. derby. Of course, the Magritte yeah. Derby. I love that. I love that. Okay, so we, I, it's been a great discussion of magic, but I also know uh, music. When did music come into your life and become so important? And why didn't you do? Why did? It was there ever a time when you thought of doing one versus the other? I mean, you talk yes. about juggling, but yes. Um, I'm realizing more and more mm-hmm. that that 
that the way I used to see music was mostly joining clubs. Mm-hmm. And I have learned uh, and, and identifying and not virtue signaling, but tribe signaling. Y- yeah, yeah. Uh, <clears throat> and I'm kind of disillusioned with that. But I've gotten with, with jazz deeper into real music. Mm. But I really believe that we are, we are dealt hands. Mm-hmm. And um, this, this big mystery that I have, which is that Guns N' Roses love the Rolling Stones. And that really confuses me. Because Guns N' Roses loved the Rolling Stones. They loved the Rolling Stones, which means the Rolling Stones were doing a job uh-huh. that Guns N' Roses really appreciated. Uh-huh. So why would they do that job? Okay, why well, instead of just why, <laughs> instead of, yeah, okay, interesting. So, uh, so interesting. my thought was I loved Bob Dylan. Mm-hmm. Still do. Yeah, of course. Loved the Velvet Underground. Mm-hmm. I love Frank Zappa. Okay. I listened to their music incessantly. I wanted to do that. And I kept going, man, the Velvet Underground, they do the Velvet Underground a lot better than I'm going to be able to. Uh-huh. Boy, Bob Dylan, you know, I'd love to play guitar. <laughs> yeah. He he does it better does than Bob me. Bob Dylan pretty well. <laughs> really well. And is there an angle? Is there an angle of something I can say to the world that is different than this? And then I would look at other people in music and I'd say... They got perfect pitch, or yeah. I, there may be no yeah. such thing. Very good tonal memory. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't want to argue yeah, about the science yeah, of perfect yeah, yeah, pitch, sure, sure. but very good tonal memory. <clears throat> they sing harmony naturally. Mm-hmm. They've picked it up in their life. They just sing harmony naturally, like the Beatles would. They could just do that. Mm, mm, yeah. thing. They, um, they have a certain kind of dexterity. They have an affinity for that. They have really, really big ears. They really have the mm-hmm. sense of yeah. that. I know I can do a lot of stuff well. I seem to be able to write a good turn of phrase. Yeah. I seem to be able to, to, to hold people's attention on stage when I sing in mm-hmm. a band or play in a band. I seem to be able to do all that. But if I go into this, mm-hmm. I have to say to myself, and deep down inside I'm a capitalist, yeah. kind of overtly I'm a capitalist, yeah, sure. I am deciding to compete with Bob Dylan. Yeah. Okay. If I go into magic... I'm competing with Doug Henning. I can win. <laughs> you know, and Teller has this theory, uh, which I think um, he, he, he's, he's very generous in applying to me, <laughs> that the only people that push an art form mm-hmm. are the people who don't belong there and don't want to be there. Gee. Bach came in at the end of Fugues. Ah, Everybody was sick of fugues. Bach mm-hmm. came in then. Mm-hmm. Wrong place, wrong time. Mm-hmm. What you don't want to be is right in the pocket. Mm-hmm. Okay. Axel Rose is right in the pocket, which means he did great stuff, didn't push the form mm-hmm. yeah, did. one bit. And I also am very... Uh, uh, f- forgive me for being perhaps too honest, but um, be I great. really wanted to feel like maybe I had something to say. I've never wanted a job in show business. Uh-huh. I've wanted to do something interesting in show business. Uh-huh. And there's a huge difference. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, there are people that I know mm-hmm. uh, that say, I wanted to do a show in Vegas, mm-hmm. which to me is nonsense. Yeah, yeah. How can you want to do a show? What yeah. show? Yeah, exactly. What show? I want to do a show. You know what I mean? It's like saying, uh, you know, I, 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 want, I want to make I want to make th- something. Yeah. What do you want to make? You know, tell me that. So there's this nightmare that I have mm-hmm. that I don't ever want to be, and sometimes I worry that I am, mm-hmm. and that is when you picture, let's go with Guns N' Roses. Yeah, okay. A Guns N' Roses concert. Mm-hmm. You've got 30,000 people there, mm-hmm. and a guy fights his way up to the front, which is difficult. Yeah. Fights his way to the front. Now he's got about a five-foot gap full of bouncers, Okay, you know, security people, uh-huh. that he's got to get across to get to the stage. Uh-huh. Okay? And that's hard. Yeah. But he does that. Okay. He does that. Okay, so yeah. he's already accomplished yeah. something. 45 mm-hmm. minutes of work, lots of de- jeopardy. He then gets onto the stage, mm-hmm. and Axel Rose is away from the mic, and our guy, our hero, grabs the microphone. Mm-hmm. Now, he knows what's going to happen. Okay, he knows yeah. that three bouncers are going to grab him. Yeah. They're going to bring him off stage. As soon as they're out of public view, mm-hmm. they're going to be very rough with him. Mm-hmm. He knows he's going to be thrown out the exit. Mm-hmm. He knows it's cold out there, and he's not wearing a shirt. Mm-hmm. He knows his friends won't come out to the concert's over, mm-hmm. that he can't get back in, and mm-hmm. that he's got to wait there in the cold for his ride home, probably two hours. Okay. He knows all of that, mm-hmm. right? 
he grabs the mic, and he now has, for six seconds, yeah. he has the full attention <laughs> 30, of 30,000 people, people, including, including Axel Rose. Rose. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And he goes, woohoo! <laughs> That's... That's what I don't want to do. Yeah. <laughs> that is a great way of thinking about it. And I see so many people in show business that you say, you mean you fought through this, you, did you went through the agents, you went through the auditions, you went through all of that, now you've got a public forum and you're going, woohoo! Yeah, no, Whoa. you know, I, I, <laughs> it's funny, in academia, you know, I often try and <laughs> compare because my life is very different than yours in, in, in many ways, but... I've always thought the same thing. When I look at the people who become academic administrators, and I, you know, I've been part of this in search committees and all of that, and and I've been part. I was, a, I was, you know, I was chair of a department, and all the rest. It, it, it's all. It's really weird because the last people you want to hire are the people that want that job. <laughs> no, really. Yeah, yeah. And and probably true for politicians. In fact probably we'd all be better off if the people we elected were the people who didn't want to be elected. Uh, you know, you go through, uh, you, you, this is one of those situations where if everything you can think of, mm -hmm. it's true for, it might also be true for the things you're not thinking of. Yeah, yeah. You know, it's just that it's someone that fits right in the pocket. I mean, it's the perfect example is Guns N' Roses. Yeah, yeah. Because, you know, what you want is the Sex Pistols. Yeah. Who, <laughs> they, they don't like the Beatles. Yeah. They don't like this. They're going to do something else. You know, and if I'd have had an idea, uh, if 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 there'd been the the feeling of rap coming along, mm -hmm. if you know those first um, those first rappers delight records had come out then, where pitch became a little less important, yeah. rhythm becomes a little more important, yeah. words become more then important, maybe. maybe maybe that would have shifted it. Had I not met Teller, that would certainly have shifted. That would certainly have pushed me into comedy. But um, you know, uh, Johnny Thompson, he uh -huh. was our mentor. We rec yeah. recently died just three weeks ago. Um, Johnny Thompson said that uh, I was able to get the ideas in uh, in magic that he and Teller didn't think of because I hadn't been studying since I was five. Oh, I he said that time when you were five to you were 18 that you weren't you're, doing what all oh, the rest of us were doing, doing is actually a big help to us because it's able to pull you, you know, yeah. what what you need is a, is a specific theory of mind to do magic. Yeah. Right? You need a specific theory of mind. And Teller, I believe is the best alive right now. And of course I'm of course I'm biased. Yeah. But there's also some evidence. Mm -hmm. Teller is the best at being able to guess what an audience. Of course an audience doesn't exist. Yeah. yeah. Audience is just a group of people. Yeah, yeah. But what an audience abstracted mm -hmm. is going to notice on a stage. It is the only skill you need in magic, right? But Teller can say things that, to me, are supernatural. He can say things like, yeah, at that point, you can put your left hand in your pocket and pull that out, and no one's going to see. Wow. I'll go, why? He'll go, the, the whole attention's flowing. It's fine. It'll be natural. Just reach in, pull it out. We got it. I'll go, <laughs> okay. And you just do and that. It works. You just, yeah, no one's paying attention. And Teller has developed... That's cool. That intuition, you know, mm -hmm. and I, I'm using that word, of course, with yeah. no supernatural yeah. Uh, yeah. feeling yeah. at all, real intuition. Yeah. He's developed that intuition for just what is going to fool people, what they're going to be thinking about. What I love the way, do. by the way, you know, not a lot of people use those two words together, develop intuition. A lot of people that's think all there it's, is. it's magic. It's yeah. literally magic. People have intuition. Well, I remember, but in science, you develop an intuition for what works and what doesn't work. It doesn't. reading work. about the fractals and the, yeah, the, yeah. the, the Mendebrot. Yeah, yeah Mandelbrot sets. Mendelbrot sets. You know, the, 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 I was reading about people just staring at them. Doof, 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 yeah, yeah, doof, yeah. Doof. Thousands of them over and over again until yeah. they could go, yep, that's one. Yeah. <laughs> you know? No, no. I mean, that's that's and, developing intuition. Yeah. And I, in fact, people often wonder why we put physics students through what we put them through in order to become physicists. Because, you know, they don't... Who the heck cares what a block plan sliding down in a plane? I mean, no one gives a damn about that. But what the <laughs> point of, of that kind of apprenticeship, if you want to call it that, is to develop an intuition of what kind of techniques work so that when you get to the point where we don't know the answer, then uh, then... You know, it uh, then they'll 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 have developed intuition because it it doesn't come. I mean, of course, 
some people who naturally adapt to that better, mm-hmm. and somehow their t- their skills. But do just that. the sense, the simple sense of when uh, if we're if we're all sitting around pitching mm-hmm. magic tricks, right, mm-hmm. and we're gonna uh, we're gonna do a magic show with you, we're, mm-hmm. pitch, we're pitching stuff, uh, you're gonna come up with stuff that can't be done, mm-hmm. and we're gonna come up with stuff that we don't know how to do. Mm-hmm. And that difference is huge. Yeah. And I'll, I'll say to Teller all the time, um, can we uh, can we can we get can we get that over there? And Teller go, yeah. And then <laughs> someone else in the room says, how are we going to do it? We, go, we have no idea. We'll, we'll get to that. <laughs> but we know we can do, do that. that. Okay. And then something else, we just no, nope, can't do that. Can't do that at all. Mm-hmm. And it's just we couldn't even tell you all the reasons yeah. it is. It's just really complicated. We can solve this problem. problem. We can't, can't solve, solve this. That and I believe that exact sentence, we can solve this problem, we can't solve this one, is all through physics and math and science. And- yeah, yeah. Uh, and actually, I don't know, this is interesting. Oh, wow, this is fascinating. Because to me, I've often said that sci- when I was talking to physics students, that physics is, is all about solving problems when you know what the problem is. Mm-hmm. And, and most often, and we do students a disservice, in fact, by filling them for years and years and years, giving them problems that are exactly solvable, that you know can be exactly mm-hmm. solved, that they are fully trusting can be exactly solved, and going ahead and do it. And then we put them out in the real world, whether it's in business or in finance or or in physics, where nothing is exactly solvable. Right. And so what you have to do, and I wonder if you, this has happened to you in, in, in your, I'm sure it has in your act, but I'll, I'd like to hear an example if it happened. So in physics, often you start working on this problem, and you realize you can't solve it. What you do is you end up turning it into a problem you can't solve. So at, at, when you've developed tricks, as you, yeah. if you say, this is what we really want to do, and in the end, it ends up being over here. Oh, it's all, that's always true. That's always true. And as a matter of fact, I have a artistic superstition that, I, that I'm in conflict with Teller. Mm-hmm. Teller is very easy, easy using words like, uh, we'll find where this bit wants to go. Mm-hmm. We'll feel where this bit wants to go. We'll get a sense of it. I get really bothered by that because I believe that what you're doing in art mm-hmm. is showing part of your heart to somebody. Yeah. So if you change the idea too much as you're going, you've lost that. Now, Teller would say, and would make an argument that I believe is correct, mm-hmm. that because you're doing it, you're always expressing stuff that you feel. Yeah. And the finding it there, he's not saying there's a path laid down by someone yeah. else. He's saying that we're just discovering through it. But I often do this um, useless exercise at the end of a trick going, yeah, that's what I started out with, kind of, mm-hmm. sort of. Oh, to make Yeah, that's where I, I, yeah, I got here, but it still has the, the, the soul, soul of, of what, what I was okay. doing. Okay. And it's it's just a cheat that I need to do because I had this belief because I'm from a small town and the first person I met in show business was me. <laughs> I never knew anybody. Really? You know, never knew anybody in show business. Not one person who had a job in the arts. Uh, Not at all. Interesting. Never. Hmm. And so I, all this stuff came handed down to me television and radio and records mm. as though it was from Olympus. And yeah. probably, uh, the two most profound things. One was the hating of Kreskin. Yeah. Uh, now and, I understand it. I never really knew that why why there was such visceral, visceral oh yeah. Hatred. It's 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 uh, as I said. You know, um, in one article I wrote about him, which you wanted to sue me for. Uh, <laughs> in one article uh, I wrote about him, uh, I said, you know, I have to keep talking about how he's wrong because I made a promise to a twelve year old boy. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to keep that you promise. Yeah, you know, yeah. I don't care anymore. Mm-hmm. But that boy still does. Yeah, yeah. And there might be another one out there yeah. who wants someone to say, it's full of shit, don't watch yeah. him. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But no, the other thing was that. that was so important to me mm-hmm. was Beetle Bootlegs. Oh, okay. The first Beetle Bootleg that came, that I, that came to Greenfield was a thing called Comeback, K-U-M-B-A-C-K. Yeah. Yeah. It was outtakes from uh, Let It Be, mm-hmm. a little, little, bit, little bit from Abbey Road, but mostly from Let It Be. I think it was maybe all Let It Be. And uh, I had believed firmly believe, and mm-hmm. I still can fall into this. Mm-hmm. I had believed that the Beatles would get the idea for Sgt. Pepper's in mm-hmm. their head. Uh-huh. They would talk about it, and they would get clearly what they wanted it to sound like. Every kazoo, oh, really? every <laughs> violin part, <laughs> every vocal. They uh-huh. would get that clear in their head, then they would go into the studio with George Martin, Mm-hmm. And they would say, this is what has to be. We have to get this kind of crowd sound to start Sgt. Pepper's. Then we want to orchestra tuning up. 
and then we'll first have a kind of fuzz guitar come in, mm-hmm. and then the on beat three, we'll have the drums come in. Okay. And they would lay that out, and they would then do it. And I would just go, this is the most perfect thing mm-hmm. ever. And that was every record, blonde on blonde, <laughs> freak out. I just believe that. And then Beetle Bootleg. Okay. $10 <laughs> at Gribbon's Music yeah. Store. I go and I buy Come Back. When I find my mama, Mother Mary, come, Mother Mary comes to me. Let it be. Holy fuck! <laughs> you mean you can work on this shit? <laughs> you mean you don't, you know, and then John singing the wrong lines? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, what? What's he doing? And then George doing a completely inappropriate solo? So that was all singing out of, I was like, Oh, you get to try this stuff. So that it didn't it didn't heartbreak you. It it you, it it opened up a totally, whole word. Totally inspired me. I mean, I want to say in this uh, please Please uh, forgive me for this, but I kind of said I can do this. Yeah. Now I'm not telling you I can do Sergeant Pepper's. Yeah, yeah. But I, I uh, can work in the arts. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So that I can that showed you it was accessible. And I still That's go really crazy important. over this when um, you know the new um, the new Blood on the Tracks, uh-huh. Bob Dylan bootleg yeah, came yeah, out yeah. with every single mm-hmm. version of it, and I am fascinated by you know this is this is all ties into one of my least favorite words, which is the word genius, Uh which is another word for lazy. Uh Someone that uses the word genius is someone who's lazy. Yeah, yeah. Because they want to say, oh, this guy can just do this. Yeah. And there's no guy who can can just just do do this. this. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, there was always this myth that was Bob Dylan did Blood on the Tracks. Uh He was having fights with Sarah. Uh They were going to get a divorce. Uh He went into the studio. He poured his heart out. He wasn't quite happy with that. He added a band. Blood in the Tracks came out. It was just pure from his heart, just poured out. Then there were rumors that there was a notebook Uh where Dylan took little (laughs) notes and worked on it. And everybody heard about the notebook. Now he's given his archives to that new museum. There were three notebooks in tiny, tiny writing. Both sides of the page. Yeah. Every yeah. single song yeah. on the album, <laughs> every single word changed. Crossed yeah, out, sure. added in, crossed out. They finally interviewed Bob Dylan and said, well, so this was just about your marriage break. Mm. Because I was reading Chekhov, <laughs> and I was interested in whether short stories could be told out of time. <laughs> and I was also studying painting, and the perspective idea of how that changes over time interested me. And I wanted to put that down in the words, and that's why I'm changing these things here and there. <laughs> but weren't things terrible with Sarah? Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> they were but I was also working on a record yeah exactly <laughs> you know a, a, there's a wonderful parallel to someone else who's a, a hero of yours and a hero of mine Richard Feynman mm. because you know Richard Feynman looked like he was doing magic because wherever whenever there was a, a conference or a problem and 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 you know people would say they talk about it and he'd go well this is this is the way to do it or or you know oh no that won't work because of this and it was like Whoa, and he loved oh, to yeah. portray that. But then you, but then n- not even enough when he died. But after he died, what you saw was thirty thousand pages. <laughs> yeah, yeah. He he, well, he worked in you know he solved every single problem. So in the end, it could say, look, you know, it's, it seems like well, it came that, out of his hand on the space shuttle. Mm-hmm. When he asked for the glass of ice water, mm-hmm. he asked for a glass of ice water yeah. and he drops the thing yeah, in. Yeah, yeah. And it's in his book on that. There's a sentence in there that blows my mind where he says. I cheated a little. I tried it before. Yeah, yeah. Do you remember that sentence? Yeah, yeah, of course. I cheated a little, tried it before. But no one knew that. Yeah. He didn't say it. It's because he was said, a showman. Let's it, just get some ice water. Let's see what happens yeah, yeah, with this. He yeah. puts it in and he acts surprised. Yeah. He was a showman. I mean, <laughs> Meg, I mean, he loved it. Well, he, yeah, because he, he loved to give that appearance. I mean, yeah. for whatever it was. It he was loved a, to walk around like Art Carney. Yeah, 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 exactly. <laughs> he wanted you to think he was Art Carney. Yeah, exactly. But you know, that Sounded was the like thing it. with, um, with Tim's Vermeer, yeah, our move that whole movie could be called Anti Genius. You know, Vermeer worked harder than we thought he did. Yeah, and lazy people want to say, "Oh yeah, yeah Bob just grabs, grabs a guitar, it. he pours his heart out, and there it is." No, motherfucker. The yeah. problem is you aren't willing yeah. to put in the yeah. amount of time Bob put in, and that's why you're not. We haven't yeah. gotten yeah. to the yeah. talent yeah. yet. Well, that's. I was going to say <laughs> the difference between genius and talent. Yeah, I mean, you can't. You, I could believe me. I could work <laughs> for a million hours. I could be Bob Dylan because yeah. I don't have that talent. 
but I could probably solve some equations that Bob mm-hmm. Dylan couldn't, even if he... Sure, he, yeah. but, but, but neither one of you gets it full-blown from the mind of Zeus. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. There's no such thing. The revelation nonsense is... I mean, you know, it, yeah, it's, it's hard work, and it... But uh, those you know, bootlegs showed me that because I believed in Greenfield, Massachusetts at 14 years yeah. old that Frank Zappa, Bob Dylan... And it was inaccessible. Geniuses. Yeah, and it was inaccessible to you. Completely. Not yeah. a chance. Oh, that's good. And uh, then hearing him, all I need is hearing him fuck up. <laughs> but did that allow you to do? To, did that allow you to be freer about music too, where you realized you couldn't? I be... still, I, st- I've always been, and still am, mm-hmm. very self conscious about music, because uh, who, who, who wrote that, 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 that great essay about learning something that you, you, you're way below your appreciation. You have to start out that way, and mm-hmm. that that's the difficult time of learning. Is it like Sedaris or somebody? Uh, I can, I forget by myself. Uh, but you know the yeah, essay yeah, I'm talking yeah, yeah, about. Yeah, 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 yeah. And 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 that's really horrible. Yeah. There's that horrible time when you can see good yeah. and you can't yeah. do it. Yeah, yeah. You know, you can't quite get there. And with music, um, I'm afraid I listen so much. And I keep, uh, I keep developing in it so much that whatever I do, I mean, I, I did something. I started playing upright bass when I was 45 years old. There have been studies mm-hmm. that have shown that you can't improve your intonation after the age of 45. Uh, I am a counterexample to that. Uh, I, I did improve my intonation. Yeah. And I don't know what it was. I don't know what it was, but when I was 45... My mom died, uh. and uh, I was—I'm a, I'm a real mama's boy. Mm-hmm. I'm very close to my dad too. Yeah, yeah, you, but I, very I, close I'm to both my parents. Mm-hmm. And um, the grief was overwhelming. Yeah, and for some reason, and I, uh, boy, that's to explain this psychologically is way beyond me. And me, too. for some reason, I desperately wanted to start to learn something that I knew I couldn't be best at. Because everything else I started, I didn't know I wouldn't be best. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Turns out I wasn't the best juggler. Turns <laughs> out I wasn't the best magi- But I didn't but know you, that you when didn't I started. Know. Yeah, 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 there's that I was, hope. I was 14 or 15. Yeah. But at 45, you learn to play upright bass. You know. Mm-hmm. There is no way. Impossible. Mm-hmm. Winning the lottery 10 times yeah. in a row on the same day, you're not going to be the best bass player. And yet you're going to learn it anyway. And I got a really good teacher, and I practiced till my fingers bled all the time. And now I'm 64 years old, so almost 20 years. And I am not good, but I am better than I ever thought I'd be. And Jonesy tells me you could be a gigging bass player if you ever wanted to, you know, cut your income by five orders of magnitude. (laughs) You could you could gig as a bass player. (laughs) That's that's heartening because you know when I was listening to your story. Uh, about music uh, again it resonated with me uh, you know i did i did degrees in uh, one degree in mathematics and one degree in physics and i was good in math and and you know pretty good it, it, pretty pretty good and and uh, and and good in physics and the difference was for me i could do math i could do any problems i could really good grades but in physics i could always see where i was going down the road and i couldn't in math i didn't in math i i thought okay i'm doing this but I don't know where to go next, mm-hmm. and so I, you know, I went. I always loved physics anyway, and 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 it was fine to go into physics. And I was always amazed at mathematicians, because uh, who I knew, who who were much better mathematicians than me. And physics, the math of physics is it seems pretty easy. And I thought, well, for these guys, physics must be trivial, mm-hmm. and they couldn't do it. But I've always wanted, and so I, I'm happy. I became a theoretical physicist, which is mathematics and physics. But I've always had this hope that's even when I was younger, I was saying, I just want to go back and do. I want to solve Fermat's last theorem, and now it's been <laughs> solved. So, but you know, <laughs> but but it's interesting to know that there's hope. Although I'm uh, 64 too, so maybe I'd have to violate. Yeah, that. you know, it's it, it's really uh, one thing I have been. Uh, do you do you know do you know another language? Yeah, I sp- I do speak French. Uh, yeah, I, oh yeah, Canadian. Yeah, so. um, I uh, I think I told you about yeah. this. I, I I haven't I haven't I haven't dug in. I have no so talent hard. in it at all. It gets harder. Oh, yeah. I know, I know. I but wanted I'm, to learn Portuguese because Feynman did. Yeah, no, and it's really hard. Uh, yeah, I know. And you know, I I got a book mm-hmm. called you know what language to learn. Yeah, and it rates them all. You know, uh-huh. and it turns out, and I you, you have to be careful when you're saying this because I, I don't mean to to, to insult them, yeah. but supposedly the best literature is in English. 
Interesting. And that's just true. Chinese doesn't have that good of literature. And there's all sorts of theories for that. Mm-hmm. One of the theories is that we have such sloppiness in that, English it, yeah. that there's many ways to say things. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And Chinese is a little more... Uh, precise. Precise, yeah. yeah. So it, it, it fucks up the literature. And you, you know, so it's what language do you want to... But the language that I could learn that could let me speak to the most people I can't speak to in English, mm-hmm. which is one of my definitions, mm-hmm. it comes down to uh, Mandarin, Arabic... Cantonese, the really hard ones. Yeah, the really hard ones. And I've thought, well, man, if I could learn, well, first of all, I got a uh, 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 bug up my ass that I that I wanted to learn all. Oh yeah. And then I read that nobody has successfully <laughs> learned it because yeah. it's so yeah. hard. Yeah. And that I could talk to nobody except yeah. like five guys <laughs> by Starbucks. <Yeah. laughs> but wouldn't it be great if you said we have Penn on, he's a magician, mm. juggler, mm. comedian, mm. speaks all. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> it's pretty cool. Yeah, it's pretty cool. But I threw that one out. Yeah. Uh, sorry. But I figured Arabic puts me on every yeah. Watch list I'm not already on. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but I I started it. I it's, got in touch with some people to teach me yeah. and went, boy, is it's this a, pissing up a rope. It's interesting when you talked about the fact that, you know, the the Kreskin thing you kept, you know, you did immaculate record keeping and everything else. I know that you're a compulsive record <laughs> keeper. Yeah, and, but you're also, in, uh, you you're dedicated. You continue to do things and that's why it surprises me that because I, you know, I'm kind of a dilettante in a lot of things, and the discipline that's required at this time in my life to learn another language, I keep wanting to. But I think you have the discipline. I, really I uh, boy, it's just I just go, boy, it's all such a long road. And then I also I was in China, you know, mm-hmm. and there I was. Uh, people were speaking to me in English who had been mm-hmm. studying English for a long while, mm-hmm. and. They were struggling so, and I went, boy, these guys have been working really, really hard, and it's not fun to talk to them, and I'm going to be there for so, so long. And meanwhile, English is winning. (laughs) (laughs) I happen to luck out on that one. (laughs) Yeah, we did. But it's it's always, it's like a rock in my shoe. Like learning to play an instrument well and read music was a rock in my shoe. I got that out of my shoe. That's amazing, because I've, you know. All I've got, all I've got is just. And, you know, my friend Tim Jennison of mm-hmm. Tim's Vermeer, uh-huh. you know, he says, you know, they say one man, one language, or one language, one man, two languages, two men. Mm-hmm. He said, you learn another language, you think different. Yeah, you, you do. You think better. Yeah, I've, well, I don't know whether I think better, but when I, I, when I got he, to the point of speaking French where I could make jokes in French, <laughs> which is the hardest thing, but I was still a different person when I was at a party And you can French. say uh, shoehorn and Brussels sprouts? Who? What? Shoehorn. And Brussels sprouts. Can you say those in French? French, no. <laughs> a friend of mine who spoke eight languages says that was his that's definition of fluent. Oh, okay. Shoehorn and Brussels sprouts. I never, never needed to use either. Okay. <laughs> Didn't say you needed it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I, yeah. Okay. But I, I got the language. But for me, it's that 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 the same thing as music. I, we talked about that. I've played miserably a whole bunch of. <laughs> I just wish I could just play one instrument well. Yeah. There's 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 moments. They're very rare for me still when I actually feel like I'm playing jazz. Oh, wow. And it's unbelievable. unbelievable. It's just, wow. Wow. I just, I just, I just, you you just kind of flow into it and it's great. Well, I'm glad you have that. I'm glad you have that. But now, you know, when you, I want to, I want to go back to that 12-year-old boy (laughs) because the, you had the makings and you still do in, in many ways of a good scientist. I mean, and and I know you're fascinated by science, but but it's not just this, you, the the immaculate record record keeping, the precision would have, would have been made you a great experimental I, physicist. I will tell you, I in taking in that inventory, yeah. uh, and I really did this. I mean, I I, I guess I seem so conniving, mm-hmm. but you know, I was in a I was in a dead factory town. Yeah, I was surrounded by. Uh, fellow children who who went to prison Mm -hmm. or worked in factories. Mm -hmm. People did not do well in my town. You know, I'm not painting it in Appalachia as its worst, but it was not a town where everybody was getting out and going going great. And uh, I was really interested in science. And I said, you know, uh, guys who are really good at science, they do three-digit multiplication in their head. They do really smart stuff. I know I'm fairly smart. I'm not smart enough. If I go into science, I'm sure 
I can get the coffee and I can back up the records <laughs> and I can keep the tables and I can do all of that. I believe that I don't I'm trying very hard to be honest and not yeah. falsely yeah. modest. I thought I could get a job in science, but I thought I'd get a better job no. in magic. <laughs> yeah, well, it worked. <laughs> you know, I just didn't. I just, you never... And then, you know, it was very hard, very hard for my mom and dad because um, yeah, sure. uh, my mom and dad, my dad didn't finish high school. Mm -hmm. and my mom and dad didn't go to college. Yeah. And they believed that everything they didn't get was because they didn't go to college. Yeah. Yeah. And they saved for me to go to college. Yeah. And then I did very well on my SATs yeah. and get a full scholarship. And you didn't? To go wherever I wanted. And you didn't? And I didn't go. And that was the hardest thing for my mom. And it wasn't until uh, MIT made me a visiting scholar no, that, that, that my dad kind of well, went, okay, okay, you can do this. <laughs> it's funny, you know, the same thing. My, neither of my parents finished high school and and, uh, and, and, and obviously didn't go to college. And and of course, my case, yeah, my mother, it, it was just, my case was more obvious. My mother wanted me to be a doctor. And, <laughs> and, and for years, when I, when I, when I got my f first, I got a very fancy job at Harvard. And uh, I remember uh, I, I was, it was the best job in the world. It really was. And, uh, I, and I phoned my mom when I, the day, the day I got it and, and, uh, I, and my, my then wife was, was, was there and I was out, went out and my mother phoned her back and said, he can still go to medical school. Oh yeah. <laughs> yeah, she was. But yeah. then, you know, then later on, now she's very proud. So it, it all worked out. All right. Yeah, yeah, it's, yeah. It's, it's very, it's very it's hard. hard. It it's really very, is very hard. hard. But, could you, did you say physicist, physician? <laughs> yeah. Could you, could you kind of do <laughs> My uncle would say physicist. Is that someone who gives someone physics? <laughs> 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 they didn't. She, my mom said, what do you want to get? Chalk on your hands? What is this? You know, it's, and it was, it's, yeah. Anyway, it's an interesting. Uh, I, I love, you don't know the joy it fills me that you could disappoint your parents uh, with your education. That's fabulous. Good. Because, you know, we, we do this. I, I see myself doing it. Uh, I have uh, I, uh, lots of friends yeah. who are very high up in academics yeah. that just go pen. You could have just gone to college and you'd be able to shut up about college because you still believe stuff we believed at 18. Yeah. That, yeah. <laughs> you were never disabused of that. Yeah, yeah. And really, it would take you one semester. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. But, you know, but, you know, I want to, you, since I've known you, I mean, I get lots of great questions from you. You were, why, I mean, what, what I was going to ask is, so at one point you turned away from science because Kreskin had convinced you it was bullshit because it wasn't different than lying. When did it come back? Uh, that might have also been Randy. You was know, Randy? I just started, because uh, reading, um, well, reading Flim Flam, mm -hmm. uh, which was Randy's mm -hmm. big book about, I realized that if I was going to get into arguments... Mm -hmm. I'm putting this in a very crass way. Sure, sure. I was going to get into arguments about psychic events. I needed to know some statistics. Okay. And I didn't know any statistics. Okay. Um, I, I, I cannot exaggerate how bad my school was. I mean, uh, if 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 you if you saw what I came out of tenth grade with, no, you know, I, I, I mean, no, I, I have really no, no, yeah. no algebra. Yeah. I mean, none. No, I have very low expectations of what <laughs> people have. When I've taught many students. I have very low expectations. You know, I mean, no algebra. Yeah, none. I, I, so now i got to go back and read statistics, and then oh, you wow. go, oh, Christ, I, uh, okay, regression to the mean. I, yeah. gonna, all the stuff you could kind of grasp, yeah. but at a certain point, you you got to do some of the numbers. Yeah, you have to do numbers. At yeah. some point. Yeah, you, you have know? to. And I so that led to this, and then um, I would like stuff. You uh -huh. know, like I would read, uh, when I would read the, it, it all started with skepticism and all started with atheism. And I'd read, you know, the uh, the anthropogenic uh, theory of this. And yeah. I'd go, oh, that, that's interesting. Oh, they cite this book. Well, I'll, I'll read that book. And it just flows out from there. And I get I get interested in something and, and read the books. And you are, yeah, I'm amazed. I'm very, I'm just so impressed because people don't realize. I mean, I, I'm quite envious and I'm not sure envious is the word, but but really impressed all the time at the at the level of the number of things you read and the fact that you don't give you just follow it up and then and then but also the, and when you ask me questions and i i think oh you know and then you want to know further stuff it's really it pushes me and i'm i'm always and then loving. you find holes mm -hmm. that are just phenomenal yeah. i mean 
and I'm talking about from a proper yeah. liberal arts education. Yeah. And I'm talking about a very smart person with a very good education, mm. like Stephen Fry. Yeah, yeah. You know, Stephen Fry, when I'm talking to him and the conversation is flowing all yeah. over yeah. like yeah. it does, yeah. and I'll just see... Oh, yeah, there's that whole Greek mythology thing mm, that yeah. I didn't know enough yeah, about. Yeah. Oh, yeah, there's this. And he just, it's such the ideal of a liberal arts education, yeah. Th- yeah. Which, is, which is designed for a gentleman to be able to talk to his friends. Yeah. That's all it's designed for. Yeah. It was not designed to get a job. To have good cocktail party conversation and be interesting. That's yeah. all it is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And there was this book, and I know that oh, you don't even want to say these words, but about the time the bell curve yeah. uh-huh. came okay. out, sure. okay. mm-hmm. there was, uh, there was uh, uh, this idea that what you needed to know what, to read the New York Times. Mm-hmm. Okay. And there was these whole oh. theories that you had to get the word within a tenth of a second mm-hmm. and know what it meant in context. And there was a book that came out that I haven't been able to find since then that just had the minimum you needed to know to read the New York Times. And because of that, and I'm so happy for electronic uh, yeah, yeah, electronic yeah. stuff, because when I read the New York Times, I try to be so conscientious and click on every word I'm not sure of. Oh, you see that? I just go. I'm not. I'm not exactly sure what that word means. I and then people tell me you cl- you click on too much of your reading. I get it from context. I said, if you're getting it from context, you're not <laughs> using the word. <laughs> <laughs> getting the word from context is the stupidest thing in the world. You want to see what that word adds to the goddamn yeah, sentence? Yeah. <laughs> right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You want to? No. No. But you have that. That's what I mean. It's this kind of rigor. Uh, uh, most people don't have the patience to do that. So I try to I try to say, well, I I know a little more about this, know a little more about that, and then I just go, oh, someone mentioned Philip mm, Roth. Yeah. God damn it! Everybody yeah, mentions Philip. Better Roth. read the book. Everybody's everybody's sick of Philip Roth, but I didn't read mm. him. God damn! What do you mm. want? Okay, American trilogy, trilogy motherfucker! Yeah. I married yeah, a communist. Yeah, okay, yeah, I'm yeah, reading. Yeah, Shut yeah. up. <laughs> <laughs> no, but I think there are two kinds of people, and, and maybe one of the reasons we resonate is. I find it, I mean, I love the fact that what I've learned since I got my PhD far exceeds what I've learned before I got my PhD, even in physics, by the way. And I think there are two kinds of people. And and maybe this sounds uh, pompous. I, I don't know. You'll tell me. But there are people who really, when they hear something, when they realize there's something they don't know, are thrilled. And there are people who are, when they realize there's something they don't know, are 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 upset, I think. Yeah. And because the thrill, the fact that there's so much more to know about the world is what keeps me going personally sure. every day. In some sense, I, I kind of think that's the difference between religion and not, in the sense that <laughs> in the sense that the thrill of not knowing. Well, yeah. And Feynman said that. I you know, well, I'm not afraid of not knowing. And my, I think that uh, I don't know if you've ever heard the 10 to 1 model I've been doing fire eating. No. Um, but I have a this was, and I, I, this is, this is just bragging. Okay, good. Uh, I just did it too, so it's good. Uh, Feynman, uh, mm-hmm. there was the, there was the monologue that closed our show on Broadway, uh-huh. closed our show off Broadway, mm-hmm. and we did it also before that in, in in L.A. And it was a final monologue I did about how to eat fire. I taught okay. people how to eat fire. Okay. And I talked about what the carnival meant to me. Mm-hmm. And uh, I had a section in there, which I, I won't do the whole thing, was I said, uh, people often think that uh, that uh, scientists are uh, don't like the mystery, want to end the mystery. And the fact is, scientists are the ones that love the mystery. Yeah, sure. The people that don't like the mystery, the people that when there's a mystery there, they just believe the first thing they're told. Yeah. Or they make up something and believe that. Mm-hmm. Or they believe anything they hear on Oprah. Yeah. Just anything to shut out the mystery and stop them from thinking. You know, what scientists want is more mystery. It's the opposite. It was a whole monologue. Yeah, yeah, sure. And it all culminates in teaching how to eat fire. It's all about oh, fire. I love that. Okay. And it's the fact of does it take away the mystery to explain the physics of fire eating, doing that whole thing. And Feynman mm-hmm. uh, saw us accidentally. Mm-hmm. We were playing a hundred seat theater mm-hmm. in Hollywood before anybody knew who we were. And he introduced himself as Richard Feynman and almost passed out. I didn't know how big a deal he was, yeah. but the deal I thought, thought he was was, was yeah. enough. Yeah. And he said, um, I mean, I mean, uh, I may cry saying it yeah. now. Feynman said, your final monologue 
is what I've been trying to explain to my wife for 20 years. Oh, wow. And I never got her to understand it. Oh. And he said she understood it tonight with you eating that fire. He said it is the most perfect description of science ever. Oh. And then three weeks later, Feynman showed up with eight Nobel Prize winners. <laughs> and to hear the, to hear. <laughs> he signed up and he, he came up afterwards and said, this may be the largest concentration mm -hmm. of Nobel Prize right. winners in a magic show ever. In a magic show. <laughs> <laughs> and none of them can figure out the, the magic. <laughs> don't, not, don't. <laughs> fool them. Don't, don't fool them. Yeah. But he said that that description, that monologue, was what he was trying to say. That it's it was not, it's not closing down yeah. mysteries. Yeah. And there's... Every time you read this anti-atheist stuff yeah. of scientists think they have all the answers, yeah, it, you just not, go, what are you, what are you talking what about? about yeah. Religion people think they, they have, have all, all the answers. answers. Exactly. And, they've got all the answers. And like you don't even have a path to all the answers. Yeah. We don't, don't even know what there. the questions are. You don't even have a path there. <laughs> yeah. I mean, if you solve every single thing you're working on yeah. right now, you can't even measure that you've this, gotten closer. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. We don't know what the questions are and we don't. <laughs> That's one of the things I've always been amused by. That we, we've talked, we were talking today about the ridiculous Templeton Foundation. This that they love this humble approach that religion is humble, and it always amazed me to say it's humble to assume the universe was created for me. <laughs> yeah. And and but in fact, and that scientists are arrogant. But what could be more humble than saying, first of all, it's not created for me. Secondly, I don't have all the answers, and I may never have all the answers. Well, these these this. The most important part to me of the scientific revolution, 300 years ago, whatever, yeah. is just three words. I don't know. I don't know. Because no one had ever said that before. No king had ever you, said that. No you get your head cut off for yeah. that, in fact. I don't know. Yeah, or burned at the stake. I don't know. I don't know. In fact, we, you know, I, you probably heard me say this, maybe, because I've said it so many times, and, is that that's, those are the most important words that teachers and parents should use. Is yeah. I don't know. Hey, let's see if we can figure it out. Because for kids, well, Feynman says, I don't know. Maybe nobody knows. Maybe no. Maybe you'll be the first, first to know. Exactly. <laughs> maybe that's what it. Maybe to the kids, you'll be the first to know. But even more importantly, it was one day I was talking. I was doing. I was. There was a movie called The Farthest, and I was being. It was. A, it was a, a premiere of it, and I was talking, and I suddenly <laughs> realized that for every kid, every time they learn something, it's the first time in the history of the world that it's been understood. <laughs> Every learning act is an act of discovery. Yeah. And we do we do such a disservice to kids by making it appear as if it's, re remember this, this is what's known. It should all be an act of discovery. I don't know. Let's figure it out. And the aha. The aha. It's is, orgasmic. It's stronger than sex. Yeah, And that's is. why you have stupid detective shows. Yeah. All they are is fake ahas. Yeah. There's yeah. nothing else. It never really works. You know, you talked about changing your mind. Mm -hmm. You talked about, uh, uh, I don't know. Yeah. And I know you've been wanting to get to this because you've been, you've been needling me with it yeah. for a little while now. You want to get to the climate change thing because oh. you just read uh, a book I wrote several years ago. Yeah, yeah. Which has an attack at someone who attacked yeah, me yeah, on yeah. climate change. Mm -hmm. um, I think that there's no way you can deny that there's climate change. Uh, I have completely changed on that. Although completely changed is a little bit confusing yeah. because I never went beyond, I don't know. Yeah. What bothers me about the climate change thing mm -hmm. uh, was a, the great disservice mm -hmm. done by Al Gore yeah. of exaggerating. Yeah, no, it's and always- We have to scare people. We have to do this. And I hate the fact that style affected me, but the kind of people- who were talking about it were the kind of people that were so dismissive mm -hmm. of people that I loved that, that I I bribed. You had an, um, you had an emotional right. reaction. It was very very emotional, and also the fact, and this is this is true for everything, yeah. which is why I don't know why it's special, but it feels special. Mm. I just don't have you know my friend Tim Jennison mm -hmm. took a deep dive into mm. climate change, mm -hmm. and Tim is really smart. Uh -huh. And Tim has the um, the the resources uh -huh. to be able to take six yeah, months and do nothing yeah. else. Okay. He it's can nice do that. that. It's a nice job if you can get it. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and he said, it's too hard. So I have to admit that I am taking climate change strictly uh, on authority fair. and pure, pure pressure. And saying that sentence 
bothers me. And yet I do it on everything else. Yeah, we all do it on everything else. Yeah. But I think you could, let me try and reassure you a little bit. We can't be experts at everything, right? So we have mm -hmm. to take into car mechanics. Uh, yeah. But but what you can always ask yourself, if you're a skeptic, is say, okay, look, I, I, you know, I don't have the time, resources, or, not, or background to be able to necessarily test everything this person tells me. But you can ask yourself the question, what's in it for them? And, and, and is, is there a reason for them to lie to me? Is there a reason for them to fabricate? Is there a reason? And I think you, those are the kind of questions you can ask. But those, hmm. that question gets the exact wrong answer that you want from me. Okay, why? Because there's a lot of reasons. Um, any sort of doomsaying of any kind is really, really sexy. Discovering the end of the world and how to it fix is, it is, makes you a superstar and a hero. There's also always money in it. Well, no, wh where's, where's the money? I mean, for most of you got, look, there's a few people who are become public figures and that's a different thing. But there are thousands of scientists who are just mm -hmm. doing this, you know, working on their models yeah, yeah. on a computer model. And they're not, whatever the answer at the end of the thing, they're not going to get more money if it's one thing or another. Yeah. In fact, as I've, you know, if they, if their computer model sh and it's well done shows something dramatically different than the rest of the crew and it, they yep, can yep, defend yep, it, yep. then they become, then they become right. famous. That's, and that's so- true. So there's every reason to try and go against the tide in science. Mm -hmm. And so, but, you, know, you know all this yeah, I know, I know. I don't need to. But I also think, and I, I guess this is just, I think it was okay uh, when Al Gore was doing all that lying to go, uh, I don't know, for a few months. Well, no. For maybe I, a year. It's always, look, it's always right to, I, th I mean, I can sympathize with that, I think. Uh, well, of course and, you I know, can. The fact but, that he, he did... In well, the fact that people oversimplify, well, and the question is, do you know it knowingly? I Here's my, look, I spend a lot of time explaining, trying to explain science, and there are lots mm -hmm. of reasons why I think it's worthwhile doing. I have very low standards in terms of what I, what I find acceptable. I mean, the bar when I, when I, when I, when I castigate something is just simply this. I'm, when I'm explaining something, I know I'm misleading at some level because I never, unless you do the exact mathematics, whatever analogy I'm providing always fails well, somewhere. Analogy long, is never true. Exactly. As long, but if I'm careful to say that, to say where it's not accurate, mm -hmm. that's fine. But the one thing that I have no tolerance for, and I know a lot of people, I'm not going to name names, um, is to knowingly mislead. That's the only thing. If if you're writing about science. And you get it wrong, fine. Or if someone reads what you've written and gets it wrong. And I remember the first time I wrote a book, in my first book, I worked very carefully to try and explain everything. And I have someone say, I love this book. It tells me this. And it had nothing to do with what I was. I was so disheartened. And then I realized, well, I can't control what people get as long as I don't knowingly mislead. And so I think what you have to do when you're simplifying or, or anything is not low, knowingly mislead. And then uh, that's the thing I don't know. But that's why I used to be arguing against by, by string theory so much is because not... I, I think there's every reason for string theorists to want to do string theory. I wrote a book about why it's somewhat well-motivated, but it's claiming that it's the theory of everything and we're on the cusp of understanding everything when there's no evidence that it that does any of that is what drove me crazy. But here's how I got beat up, mm -hmm. okay? Uh, we did a thing called uh, uh, um, Comic Relief yeah. for Homeless sure. yeah, with yeah. Robin Williams, mm -hmm. you know what I mean? And there was this whole speech in there that said anyone can become homeless. Mm -hmm. It's not just if you're mentally ill. It's not just if you're on drugs. It's not just this. This could happen to anybody or your family any day. But I said to Robin, that's not true. Oh, well. That's really not true. More, a great number of the homeless people do have mental illness issues. Oh, yeah, sure, sure. A great number. Yeah. It's not true that it hits people at random. No, no, And no. there's no way doing but, it. But there's things that can happen to you that you have no control right. of. Right, but yeah. what I'm talking about is they were saying, well, that helps us have more compassion for people. Oh, I see. And I was saying, no, 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 no. We just tell the truth. These people need help. help. Let's yeah, help them. Yeah. The exact same thing happened. Uh, we started an organization called Broadway Cares, mm -hmm. which is for uh, uh, people uh, suffering uh, with AIDS. Yeah. And it was in the 80s. It was very early on, uh, very early on. And I was in all these meetings, and they would say, we have to stress that this is not gay. This is not drug users. This is everybody. Mm -hmm. And this is going to be moving to the straight population yeah. right away. Mm -hmm. And I say... Um, well, we don't know that. Mm -hmm. 
Mm-hmm. So far, it is drug users, and it is mm-hmm. yeah. gay. Yeah. And uh, we can tell people that. And they said, no, 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 we won't get any help from people if we do that. We have to scare everybody with that. And I said, no, no, we, we can't. You, no. And they'd say, and, 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 and I'm now quoting, so please forgive me, you're not going to get America to care about a bunch of faggots. Okay. And I said, well, maybe they do. Maybe maybe there is a love out there. You can't assume. And they said, we have to say it's going to everybody. Uh, so there were all these shows in the 80s saying, you know, it's going to move into yeah. the straight population this amount of time. And their point of it was we need to help people. It was done for compassion. And then I was asked to do VO when I was on uh, Comedy Central. Mm-hmm. And they said, um, uh, this much rainforest is being destroyed every day. But mm-hmm. da, 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 da. Yeah. And there was just a series of numbers I yeah, was giving. Yeah, yeah. And this studio wasn't ready, mm-hmm. which is their only mistake. <laughs> and I went through and I did the mathematics, yeah, the, okay. the arithmetic, not yeah. mathematics, arithmetic. Just, just yeah. did it. Yeah. And I said, this, this actually doesn't play out. Uh-huh. You just said the number of acres <laughs> and stuff, and I just <laughs> multiplied it out. And it's just wrong. <laughs> and they said, doesn't matter. And I said, well, no, it does. It kind of does. does. And they said, well, we got this from the, it does. I said, well, just let them tell me. Let me call somebody because I'm not good at this. Yeah. But there might be something wrong here. Yeah. And they said, doesn't matter. Just do the VO. And I said, fuck you. <laughs> and that's, I just left. Well, no, that's, you know, that's, uh, you see, that's your damn problem. You're just too honest. But, so, <laughs> no, I mean, I, I'm, I, you know, I have to. Con- I, but I, what I, I'm saying you is. You are one of the most honest people I've ever met. But what I'm saying is. Al Gore, please, for the love of Christ, you've got something that could be the end of the world. Don't cheat. Do not cheat. Don't say we need a little more fear. Don't say that by the year, whatever he said, by the year 2015, we're going to have four inches of water in Central Park. Whatever that was he said. I'm I'm making it up. I know that's wrong. So don't say, oh, Penn doesn't know either. I know it's wrong. I made it up. But he said said Mm -hmm. these things here. And all of these people... You know, it's like we, we've been burned so badly. We had the population bomb yeah, yeah. that was right. on the seventh. Er, Paul, well, I remember, li- and well, I'm, I was really influenced by a book called Limits to Growth when yeah, I was yeah, yeah. And, and I mean, and it was well intentioned, by the way. Of course. But it was just, it's just what happens is technology responds to problems. And yeah. so you can't predict very well, which is, by the way, why I never try and predict anything less than two billion years in the future. <laughs> yeah, first of all, no, don't no, be around to check my math. But, but, but <laughs> when we're dealing with it, and yeah. also anybody who says, uh, we got to fix climate change. I'm against nuclear power. I just go, you're insane. Yeah, yeah. Because if we got to fix climate change, everything's on the table. Everything. And, and most people I know who are, I mean, all the real, real rational people I know say everything has everything's to be on the, the table. Everything has to be on the table. Because, you know, we might not get uh, solar or wind. Yeah, we yeah. might yeah. not get more than 15 to 20% yeah. out of that. We've just got to stop fucking coal. Yeah. Stop the stop fucking coal. coal. Now, you know, and... And we talked about the fact that people are afraid of the word nuclear. Yeah. And, it, and, and it's so amazing because... First of all, radioactivity is so much easier to detect than almost any other kind of pollution. I mean, <laughs> right. I mean, I just, it's trivial for me to detect the most minuscule amounts of radioactivity in this room versus, versus any other pollutant. Plus, the number of people that have ever been killed by any nuclear accident well, in the history you know compared people, to the number by coal in every, on every day. You know how many people Three Mile Island killed? No, no, a lot of people because th- that was shut down. Yeah, because it was shut and down and then they cold. cold. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, there you go. That's you know, good. it's like the people that were uh, that were killed on nine eleven by more people driving cars and having more car accidents. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But you know, it, it seems like uh, it seems like the solution, uh, if there is one, mm-hmm. uh, has got to be technological. Well, I mean, yeah, it's going to be because it's so much. Unfortunately, I agree with you completely because unfortunately. Technology is so much easier than changing society. Mm-hmm. It, it, it's just... Now, I, also, I'll tell you, I don't think there's going to be a solution in the near term. There are going to be technological mediation. And I mean, mm-hmm. and and there may be solutions to taking carbon out of the atmosphere. I've been involved in projects, in fact, that that, are, that try and do that. And I ran programs that actually... Yeah, there's so one whether, thing happening over in the Netherlands. There, we're already past the point where nothing... Where, where we're, we're not going to have to adapt. Yeah. So what we need to do is think of technological adaptations as well as... That doesn't, however, the problem, and many of my colleagues say, don't say that because it means it suggests to people well, that, that we don't have to change. That's exactly that's exactly the problem. Yeah. The other thing is, you know, I was trying to think 
mm-hmm. of uh, of an example where um, where conservation worked. Mm-hmm. Uh, they're few and far between. I mean, we were running out of we were running out of tin. Mm-hmm. We were trying to save tin. Everything was about tin. Then aluminum came along. Yeah. Now there's plenty of tin. That's the way it usually. Well, that they're often the point is technology technology can be a game changer, and it often is. But but having said that, and I, I guess I was strongly influenced by Amory Lovins, who I've known for a long time, who who would point out that you know most of so in in big tall skyscrapers in New York City. Most of the energy, so their air conditioning in the summer. Most of the problem, the air conditioning, is that the is that they're overheating the buildings with the lighting. So you're putting all this energy in to do what you could do if you more efficiently designed the lighting that wouldn't put the energy in in the first place. Mm-hmm. That'd be a lot cheaper than building a nuclear power plant, mm-hmm. for example. He used to yeah. point out. And so those those we have to do yeah, those yeah. kind of rational things. By the way, you know, interestingly, because uh, I've been involved. And let in some, things cost what they really cost. But, yeah, we let gasoline cost, cost what, what gasoline really, cost. Yeah, <sighs> yeah, exactly. And yet, people in this country will always be opposed to that. And but you know, it's interesting. But because there's also perception. I was involved in an energy conference once, and and there there was a group in Sweden that had built a house that didn't need heating. This is Sweden yeah. in the winter, but they designed passive solar and lighting in such a way that it, you could live in that house and you'd never need a furnace. Mm-hmm. No one would buy into this thing because no one believed it's possible. It just seemed mm-hmm. irrational. So you've got to overcome that kind of prejudice in so many ways. Once again, it comes back to lying in some sense. Distorting reality is what upset you about climate change. I want to talk about ethics because I think you've talked about ethics a lot in the times I've known you in many different contexts. And something you wrote about sort of surprised me in a way. You're not what I, someone I would call necessarily politically correct, okay? Yeah. Yet at the same time, you wrote poignantly about not wanting to offend people. mm mm-hmm. And I found that kind of interesting because in some sense, when speaking the truth inevitably offends some people. And so I wanted, and you said you wouldn't, you you don't swear in front of your children. I don't know if you still don't. That's that that's changed. That's changed? That's changed. Uh, I go through periods, you know, there was a time, uh, Lawrence O'Donnell mm-hmm. um, from MSNBC, Lawrence O'Donnell and I, and Lawrence O'Donnell, of course, has a different image than I do, but mm-hmm. Lawrence O'Donnell's from Dorchester. Uh, okay, I know Dorchester. You know, everybody yeah. knows Dorchester. Yeah. And uh, Lawrence O'Donnell and I were once in a taxi cab in New York City. Mm-hmm. In a taxi cab in New York City. Okay. <laughs> and we were talking, and the subject is very important, we were talking about how to get a picture frame to hang uh, in art, straight on the wall. Okay. That was the discussion. Okay. We drove in the taxi cab, and we finished. <laughs> the taxi cab driver in New York City said, I've never heard two people swear more in my life. <laughs> <laughs> he was, hello, do you like Get the motherfucker, get the motherfucker <laughs> level, put the motherfucker, the motherfucker level, the cocksucking kick, get the fucking motherfucker. The, and that's what, and we're talking gently about hanging pictures. <laughs> and uh, I was with uh, another friend of mine who's a record producer named Kramer, who uh, butthole surfers and all these other yeah. bands. We were all, we were all out uh, eating, uh, eating supper. And one of us said, I don't know who, we should just stop swearing. Oh, okay. Completely. Yeah. Absolutely. Now, the rules were very simple, uh-huh. okay? We would not ever use euphemisms. Okay. We would say fuck if we meant intercourse. Okay. You know, mm-hmm. we would say, we, you know, we would, we would say cock. Mm-hmm. N- n- yeah, not yeah. that, not kind of swearing. Yeah, yeah. But no goddamn, mm-hmm. but also no gosh darn. Okay. And no golly. Yeah, and go, and no, gosh darn. It was Rob Pike. It was also yeah. Rob Pike was there, too, with yeah. four of us. Uh We'll all just stop. And we all did. Mm -hmm. And it was phenomenal. Because I'd get emails from Rob Pike going, I banged my toe yesterday. (laughs) And he said, I just, ouch. (laughs) He said, I hadn't said ouch in so long. And ouch is a fine word. It's not a bad word. Ouch. (laughs) He said, and we did that for about a year and a half. And it was really illuminating and really fun. And then uh, when my children were born, I realized I was saying God damn in Jesus Christ all the time. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to stop it for the exact opposite reason people might think you want to. Mm -hmm. I just didn't want my culture that I was given to my children to be that steeped in 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 Christianity. In Christianity. Okay. Give it it the oxygen. Yeah. So I just wanted to phase that out. Mm -hmm. And now I... 
go through phases. It depends a lot on whom I'm, who I'm around, mm-hmm. what I'm doing. I also did, I was really interested in transgressive mm-hmm. humor. Mm-hmm. And I did a movie, The Aristocrats. Yeah, sure. And got it out of my system. Oh, I see. Really had really no interest. Now when someone like pushes the envelope in offensive comedy, <laughs> uh-huh. I'm just bored. Because okay. I tried to get 100 people to uh, go as far but, as they could, yeah, and they did. Yeah, and, yeah, and, then and I'm, not saying other, I'm not saying others should be bored. Yeah, yeah, but, you, but I, for you. Okay. I heard enough of it, you know. Um, but, so I, I really, you have, you know, there's two kinds of performers that work for me. Mm-hmm. One is the sociopath mm-hmm. who needs nothing from you. Mm-hmm. Dean Martin yeah. being the best example. Bob Dylan being a partial example. Uh, Dean Martin, it did not matter when you were in the audience how much you loved him mm-hmm. or how, how much, much you hated him, hated him mm-hmm. or booed him. There'd be nothing different from him. And mm-hmm. there is something so sexy about that. Y- yeah. If you've got someone that you can't touch, yeah. that you think that if you insulted them or you kissed them, it would make no difference to them, you just want to hold them and hug mm-hmm. them and have them own you forever. <laughs> I mean, that is one of the sexiest things, uh, I think, especially for men. Mm-hmm. Especially for men, two, two men, men. Okay. it just brings that out very strongly. Mm-hmm. Um, I do, I do know. So I'm there, it's funny. It's very enticing. I know a few people who really amazingly don't care, and I mean, who do what they do because they believe what they do, and they don't really care. And and it's not just that they're saying they don't care. They don't. And and, and I, I would like to be that way in certain ways. And, and also, you don't don't you feel an attraction? Yeah, of course. You want to please them? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And the other kind of person I want to see perform is someone who desperately, like mm-hmm. Don Rickles, <laughs> yeah, who just needs every second, or Jerry Lewis, every yeah. second needs that kind of uh, confirmation. I have, which I think is a is is a good formula for the way I work. Mm-hmm. I have the desire to be loved by everyone, offend nobody, yeah. but do it on my terms. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And that and that keeps attention yeah. going. Yeah, no, I can I, see I, I can't I can't actually do the glad handing thing. Yeah. yeah. I I try very hard mm-hmm. to be complimentary yeah. and be polite yeah. and 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 give reinforcement. Yeah. But I try to always mean it. Yeah, yeah, which no. Is not, which is not that it's, hard. Which is better. Yeah, no, it's not that uh, hard. It, it, and, well, it, it, and for some people it is, but it's I also the meaning try, it makes a lot. I also know that um, shock and surprise and out of left field and sexual stuff yeah, yeah. and this and that will get laughs. It's part of it's what easy. comedy is. It's, yeah. it's not just easy. It's, it's yeah. You know, it's like with George Carlin you know, yeah. has, has a direct answer to yeah, that. Yeah. He says people just say using those words are easy. He just says it's just one of the things you can do. Yeah. Leave everything out there. Yeah, yeah. You know, you don't say in conversation, uh, don't use the word the. Yeah, Because yeah. it's, it's, it's kind just, of easy. It, yeah. <laughs> well, no, but it fits right in there. It's the right thing in there. You know, it does the right thing. People used to say to me, um, when I was, I used to do Howard Stern all yeah, the time. Yeah, I remember that. And people would say to me, uh, Howard Stern just doesn't care what people think. And I would go, no, no. Yeah. He cares desperately what people think, but he acts anyway. You know? Yeah. And this gets said so much, but th- th- you can't say it too much, I don't think. Bravery is not the absence of fear. Of course. It's Bravery is action in the, in face, the face of, of fear. fear. Absolutely. So, yes. I want desperately to not offend and everybody like me, and I also want to be brave. Yeah, oh, oh, okay, that's beautifully said. I mean, I, I, yeah, it's beautifully said because I think that is the definition. Knowing that you know, you ha- you're going to end up doing something that, that causes offense. But I, that's why I was surprised to read in some sense that you don't want to offend people because it was actually Stephen Fry who said, we have in our society this notion that being offended gives you special rights. Oh, yeah, yeah. Well, that, that's, that's a whole different issue. You don't have special issue. rights if you're That's offended, a whole different right? issue. You, you own that problem. Uh, I, I, uh, you do not have any right to not be offended. Yeah. That does not mean I want to feel Exa- cruel when I do it. Yeah, ex- exactly. But those are two di- entirely two. different issues. The, yeah, they really entirely are. Different. Yeah, yeah. And I do very much like to be shocked and yeah. offended. Yeah. I enjoy those feelings yeah. very much. Yeah. And I believe that's part of the human experience and yeah. part of everything else. Well, part, we, I think it's a character thing. I mean, I'm 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 similar, but I think there are a lot of people who hate either of those. Yeah, I guess, I guess. Yeah. But I like what what the f- what was that? Yeah, yeah. You know, there's there's a line in the bit we did years ago uh where Teller and I 
it's one of the only bits you've ever done that takes place not in the theater. Uh-huh. It takes place in a it's it's a, it's a playlet that we okay. do within our show, the short play, and we're not Penn and Teller. We're two different characters. Okay. And I, I discover myself handcuffed to Teller inexplicably. Uh-huh. He's a stranger, and I'm handcuffed to him. And then the the story is about how I deal with being handcuffed to the stranger, and how this goes to and it turns into a magic trick because the handcuffs vanish. Maybe yeah. they were never there. But um, there's one moment. Where I look at the handcuffs, look at Teller, and I say, this is great. This is terrific. What is this? <laughs> and I've had like 10 friends say, if I had to sum up all of your life, <laughs> it would be that <laughs> one scene. This is great. great. This is <laughs> terrific. What is this? <laughs> they said, the only time we see you excited about something is when you are completely and utterly confused in the dark. Your first reaction to not understanding is a huge, huge grin. <laughs> Look, this is great. This is terrific. Gross. What is this? <laughs> That's why, my friend, you would make a great song. That's a great, I think it's actually, that's a great way to end because it's a perfect, it's, 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 it is, for me, it represents what science is all about. It represents what you are all about. And it's one of the reasons I like you so much. <laughs> and <laughs> thanks, I like you too, th- Thanks a lot. Thanks, thanks for coming. Man. Thank you. The Origins Podcast is produced by Lawrence Krauss, Nancy Dahl, Amelia Huggins, John and Don Edwards, and Rob Zepps. Directed and edited by Gus and Luke Holwerda. Audio by Thomas Amison. Web design by Redmond Media Lab. Animation by Tomahawk Visual Effects. And music by Rickolis. To see the full video of this podcast, as well as other bonus content, visit us at patreon.com slash origins podcast. <laughs>